This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangent. Hi, I'm Ken Tangent. This is episode 49 of What's It Like. My guest is Daryl Peart. Hey, Daryl. How are things in Seattle? Uh, kind of cool and drizzly. <laughs> yes, that is Seattle. <laughs> you didn't grow up in Seattle, though, did you? No. Well, uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. I grew up in um, uh, Wenatchee and Auburn and Sumner, which are, you know, uh, Auburn and Sumner aren't too far away from Seattle. That's true. Wenatchee is more, uh, it's east side of the mountains. and Yeah, uh, yeah eastern Washington. and uh, Lots of apple trees. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to work in the orchards in uh, high yeah. school there. So did you come from a large family? My immediate family was just my, I only had one sibling, uh, but uh, uh, I have oh, probably 16 or 18 cousins. My dad has had a lot of brothers. Ah. When you were growing up, what was the largest influence on your life? Oh, I think there was probably several, actually, that had a lot of influence on me. My, uh, my father, uh, my great-grandfather, my grandmother, my mother. Hmm. Um, in what way did they influence you? Oh, um, different ways. My, my, um, I, I think I learned different lessons from different ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad, I think I, I, I learned the value of, of honest labor. You know, he, he worked hard and he taught me to work hard. And my mother was, had kind of an artistic inclination. So she was always talking about seeing things like an artist would see things. Oh. You know, so and, and and in my book, I dedicated it to my mother and my father, and I said that uh, uh, my mother taught me uh, the ways of the artist, and my dad taught me the way of uh, honest labor, and those are the two ingredients of the arts and crafts movement, which is the style that I work in. Ah, yes. So, what was your major challenge as a child? Probably shyness, I guess. I hated to get up in front of people, and uh, I was the kid in in class that. Uh, hope the teacher would never call on them and sit in the back and mm -hmm. just stay quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you always want to be a woodworker? I, I guess somehow. I mean, I my great-grandfather uh, was a carpenter, and one of my earliest memories was um, when, when he got older and he was ill, we moved into the big house out front, and he uh, was still active enough that he could repair this little cabin that he had in the back of the property. And I can remember watching him, you know, install the windows and doors and, and hammering nails and stuff. And I, I was really fascinated with it. And I thought that was really, really neat stuff. So how did you become a woodworker? I kind of fell into it, I guess. I, my first job out of high, well, my second job out of high school was making laminated beams, wooden. So there was a lot of woodworking tools. And at one point, I just kind of um, decided that I, this is going nowhere, and I just quit the job, not knowing what I was going to do. And I ended up uh, selling little plant holders and stuff at the Pike Place Market mm. in the North Arcade. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you know about the the market. Yeah. And uh, I went on from there to doing the street fairs, and then I uh, I realized, and I was doing, I was rather successful. I was selling stuff like crazy, and I. The problem was, is I was kind of stuck making these little trinkets and what I call trinkets, plant holders and and stuff. And I and I and I didn't have the time to break out of that. I I was busy making this stuff and I couldn't. So what I and ended up decide I, at that that's the point where I really decided that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I got serious about it and I realized I'm not going to learn what I want to learn by just selling at the market. I, I, I don't have the time to even teach myself. Mm -hmm. So I went out and found a job in the cabinet shop and then bounced around oh. several different shops. I would work at one shop for a while and then I'd say, well, well, this shop over here, they're just doing this kind of interesting thing. You know, I think I'll go get a job over there and learn what they're doing. And um, that's kind of how it went. What's it like working in a cabinet shop? Uh, I think most cabinet shops are uh, borderline sweatshops. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're a little um, oh, they can be okay, but in a lot of times they, uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure on and a lot of uh, dust in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's it's not the most agreeable place to work. If you advance beyond the cabinet shop and get into the little custom furniture shops, they're a lot more fun to work in. Mm -hmm. They still have cabinet shops. I mean, that used to be the way they were done, but now there's so much mass market stuff. 
Yeah, there. I, I think a lot of the there are still cabinet shops, I believe, but it, it, it's they're really hard to um, to to make a living at because they're competing with people that are you know selling them for really really cheap, mm-hmm. and you know so it, it's a very very difficult um, way to make a living. Mm-hmm. You, it, it's impossible to uh, uh, compete with uh, the cabinets coming out of Lowe's or or Lowe's or Home Depot unless you're hitting the real high end, you know, and then it's hard to break into that high end market. Right. So what exactly do you do? Oh, I, um, I design and build furniture. Um, well, I, and I, I, and along the way I've, I've ended up doing other things as well. I, uh, I write a lot of Martin magazine articles on woodworking. Uh, I've written a book. I, uh, I teach woodworking. Mm-hmm. All those things kind of tie in, I guess, and, and help. Yeah, and it, well, it, it, you know, just it's not just um, uh, going down in the shop and, and building furniture. You know, you've got to promote yourself, and I, so I've learned how to do, um, you know, websites. I maintain my mm-hmm. own website and, and, and all that stuff too. So there, there's a there's a lot of stuff going on. It's not just making sawdust. <laughs> What's the best thing about your job? Oh, when I when I uh, designing. There's two places where you, you really mm-hmm. need to get creative, and that's what I really enjoy. Uh, I, I really don't like the book work or any of that. My wife does a book work for me, but I still have uh, office work that I need to do, and I, that's, I dread that. But I, I really, really, really enjoy designing uh, furniture, and, and then once I've designed something that I've I like the challenge of building something I've never built and something that's a little difficult. And, and, and there's also a lot of creativity when you um, – are trying to figure out how to make something. Uh, how, how are you going to do this operation? How are you going to make that happen? You know, so mm-hmm. there's almost as much creativity and learn and, and figuring out how to make it as, as as coming up with a good design. So those two things I really really enjoy. Uh, they 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 get me fired up. What's the worst thing about your job? Yeah, well, I think it's probably self-inflicted because I worked for so many years and, and didn't have, <laughs> and, and I, I'm trying to cure myself of this. I, I, I worked for so many years and, and, and uh, did not have work coming in, and now I have lots of work coming in, and I have a hard time turning it down, and I overextend myself. Mm. And then I, I get this, uh, uh, this, everything's behind schedule, and, and that, that's, what I, that's the part I don't like uh, is when I, when I get uh, overextended. Mm-hmm. And uh, and having to call clients up and saying, "Well, we're going to be late." Is yours the kind of business where you can hire others to assist you? Yes, I, I've done that before, uh, and um, what I, I that what what I became when I did that was was more of an administrator, and I like to mm-hmm. be the guy that's getting sawdust in his lungs. You know, I like to be down on the floor doing it myself. <laughs> uh, I do that to some degree now. I have a guy that worked for me for a few years, and I kind of farm things out to him once in a while. But I let him know that um, I prefer, you know, that he does it over in his shop, and and I'm alone. I like working alone. Oh. I'm really, really good at doing a job if I can put the blinders on and go forward. But interruptions, you know, like if I have an employee, uh, they're they're interrupting me um, several times a day, and they have to. You know, I can't chastise them for that. That that's what they're supposed to do. They need to ask me questions on how to, to do things and and how I want this done. But every little interruption, what it does is it disrupts my train of thought. And then, then I have to get back my head back into where I was, and and uh, my mind doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, it slowly gets back to where I was. Are each of your pieces unique? Uh, not necessarily. I I'll re- I repeat designs. I, I come up with mm-hmm. a uh, good design, and I'll repeat it. I they are unique in the in in one way. Some well, sometimes they are unique because I I have. Um, I'm not the best of businessmen. I, if I was a good businessman, I'd come up with a fairly good design and just leave it alone. But I am always tinkering with my designs. And, and so that means I've got to remake the jigs and stuff. So <laughs> every time I do it, I, I, I really see where, oh, I think I need to improve this little part of the design right here. And so I end up making all the... It, 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 it's paid in the long run because it's got me noticed as a designer that uh, I probably would have made more uh, money if I would have, wouldn't would do that all the time if I just stick with one design and go forward. What type of person would be good at your job? Oh, uh, there, there's a couple different skills that are 
well, this is what I like about woodworking, too. It demands a couple different things from you. Uh, there's a lot of creativity that's needed uh, to come up with designs and stuff like that. But there's also some good practical mechanical knowledge that's needed to, you know, to work tools and, and, you know, and that sort of thing. So there's, and you've got to have a lot of manual dexterity. You know, you, 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 uh, if you put the tool in your hand, I, when I teach classes, I can, I can see that a lot of people, they, they have difficulty holding the tool in their hand, right. I can show it to them over and over and they still can't quite get it. But, if you're going to do this job, you've got to be able to get it. <laughs> <laughs> do you need a lot of tools to do the job? Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, actually, there is a never-ending <laughs> need of tools. <laughs> I, I I think I'll never quit buying tools. Um, I'll be done buying tools to the day I die. Yeah, you could get by. You could get by with uh, probably some minimum, if uh, you know. But um, most people in in my position. They're they're kind of nuts on tools, so they end up buying them anyway. <laughs> if there is such a thing, what what is a what's a typical day like for you? Oh, okay. Um, there isn't. Well, there is, I guess, to some degree. But I I get up in the morning. I'm up at um, oh four thirty uh, usually or so, and I'm out in the shop by five five thirty. Uh, and the first thing I do is I check email in the morning and, and, and do correspondence and stuff like that. And then, um, uh, well, there's one or two things I'm going to do after that. If, if I'm, if I'm, I might be engineering a job, I still may be designing or engineering and then I'll sit at the computer for several hours and do, and just sit and design or, 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 you know, work out the engineering problems on a, on a piece of furniture, either that or I'll head down to the shop. If I've already got the job engineered and it's, you know, the deposits on it and everything. And I'll, um, I'll start turning the machinery on and 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 making noise and sawdust. <laughs> uh, and it just and then and then you know then I just all day uh, like that you know um, break for lunch and five o'clock four thirty five o'clock I uh, turn off the lights and turn off the compressor and walk out the door. So it's it's, it's not uh, there's not a lot of uh, well there, there's a lot of little breaks in between. Sometimes I need to if a tool breaks down or something like that I I, I stop and I have to run to town to get a a part for uh that's another thing you need to learn how to do is you you uh have to figure out how to fix a tool when it breaks down sometimes you don't have the time to take it somewhere and have it fixed you need it done now because the job is in process and and it's due and you need to get this tool fixed so uh there's there's little interruptions like that and then there's little interruptions where at lunchtime I'll check my email and if there's someone emailing me or contacting me about a potential job, I usually get on that right away and, mm-hmm. and, and return that email. I don't let um, leads on jobs get very cold. Is the is software that you use to, for your design, does it have to be specialized? Well, in some ways, the uh, uh, the CAD software, the drawing. So you use a CAD program? Yes. Uh, what, uh, what I need is I need stuff that I can measure down to point zero zero one. One, one one thousandth of an inch, and um, and it has to be able to. Well, there's a lot of these are are are, are pretty common in CAD programs now. It's not all that specialized, uh, except that I see. I'm a, I I do woodworking a little different than some do. I I take some of my drawings down to the CNC people and I have them run out patterns for me hmm. and and make my jigs that way. Uh, you know what CNC is? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, it's computer numerically controlled. It's a it's, it's a big industrial router that will cut out patterns uh, precisely to within a thousandth of an inch of of what you tell it to cut out. So if you have an odd curve or or something like that, and you got to meet that with another curve that's a sixteenth of an inch away. That CNC machine will cut that pattern out precisely, and then you take that back to the shop and you use that to uh, to cut out the actual work. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in other words, I guess that my um, program needs to be exportable to whatever program that the CNC people use, which is usually PXF. And then I need to just have have layers where I can go different layers in the program and uh, a lot of precision down to a thousandth of an inch. With technology changing all the time, do you think there'll be a point at which you'll design it on your computer and push a button and it'll cut out the pieces that you need right there in your shop? Those capabilities are already here. There's people doing that now, but I Part of the fun for me is to actually go go down and cut stuff out. So I, there for everyone, I guess there's a um, uh, you've got to figure out 
where that dividing line is, you know, and for me, I, I don't want to quite go that far, but uh, I can see that coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 40 years from now, they'll look back on me and think I'm a dinosaur that I did it this way. But the guys <laughs> that I, most of the guys that are my age that I started woodworking with think that I'm a little nuts for using CNC and computers, you know, so. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the new, the younger guys, the guys, young guys that I teach, the guys in their 20s, they are all into, um, the way, my methods, you know, where I, I use CAD and, and all that, too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's quite different from doing hand tools only. Yeah, it is. It is. Daryl will tell you that what you should do with your life right after I remind you of the good work being done by the American Red Cross. If you ever need an operation, you'll be glad people donated their blood to help you. So I want to remind you to give blood and to donate to the American Red Cross. They've been doing good for a long time, and you can help. Somewhere in the world today, there are people you can help through the Red Cross. So go to redcross.org. So, Daryl, everybody has to give themselves motivation occasionally. How do you give yourself a kick in the pants? There are times that I go along and, I, and, I, and I, um, I've got to kind of revitalize myself because I, I get too much into the drudgery of the, you know, the schedule and, and just pumping things out. I guess what I got to do is I've got to just stop and say, you know, once I get this schedule done, I'm uh, what I really, really enjoy doing is designing and, and, and stuff. So every once in a while, I just got to stop. You know, once I get caught up, I got to get the things, the schedule done. But then I tell myself at the end of the schedule, I'm going to allow myself to do what I call a spec piece. You know, that's a speculation piece. That's not for sale or it is for sale, but it's not, it's not client driven. It's just, I get, mm-hmm. Yeah, I get back to what I wanted to do, which is is, is designing and and make a piece for myself. Not for myself, but, you know, for um, the direction and designs that I want to go. That That's what motivates me is, is the uh, uh, designing and stuff. If I, if I get too far into just the, like I said, the daily um, routine and drudgery, then I, I've got to ever so often stop and go back to what I really wanted to do. Let me turn the question around. When you have to soothe yourself... How do you calm yourself down? I, I've been meditating for 40 years, uh, transcendental meditation. I do that once in the morning, once in the evening, and that uh, that keeps me pretty level. That in the evening, uh, also, I um, after um, dinner and stuff, I sit down, and one of my, or probably my only hobby, I guess, is uh, outside of woodworking and design, is, um, is vintage audio gear. And so I, I put on uh, some music and just, zone out for about an hour. <laughs> you do uh, vinyls? No, no. I, I have all my old vinyl, but I, I, I have... Uh, someday I may get more vinyl. I, I've got some uh, high-end CD, uh, SACD, if you know what that is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Super Audio CD. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and uh, just some old... Um, the old uh, uh, audio gear that I wanted to buy in 1973 but couldn't afford. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? Yes. Uh, that's probably getting up in front of a uh, uh, an auditorium and giving a speech. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, like I said earlier, I was the guy that uh, didn't want to get up in class and sit in the back of the class and hope no one called on me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then at one point I realized if I really want to further my career, I was getting requests for uh, teaching and 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 speaking, and I uh, and I just turned them down for a while. And then I realized, you know, I need to get over this. And and if I if I'm going to get anywhere, I I need to uh, conquer this. Mm-hmm. And and it took it took me um, oh probably four or five years before I really got it behind me. Hmm. There was when I first started teaching. If I had you know four or six students, I was nervous as could be, and. Now it uh, it uh, really doesn't bother me at all. You know, I might if I have to speak in front of a large group, I still may get a little nervous, but not the not the just um, almost uncontrollable bout of nerves that I had you know years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and and I, I have gotten over it. I, I I did conquer that. It was, but that was probably the hardest thing for me to get past. If you were giving a commencement address for high school or college graduation. Giving your best advice, what would you say? Uh, probably what I used to say to my kids. I would say you need to, um, 
well, maybe if it might be too late if it was college, but for high school, I'd say that you, in, in picking a career, you need to, um, there's two ingredients here. One, you've got to enjoy your work, but two, it's got to pay the bills. So uh, something that it just brings in lots of money that you don't enjoy in the long run won't work, you know, because you want to mm-hmm. get happiness out of life and you're not going to get it if you don't enjoy your job, your work. So there, there's a compromise there and you've got to find out where that compromise works for you. You know, th- th- you've got to, you've got to get up in the morning and, and want to go to your job, want to work. But it also, it can't be just something that doesn't make any money either. You've got to live in the real world. You've got to, you've got to pay the bills. So it's, it's got to be a little bit of both. My last question is to help me get better at this process. We all have events in our lives that change us and impact us. Anything you wanted to say that you haven't had a chance to say? I can't think of anything. If it was a group of woodworkers, there was probably a few things I would say. Okay. You're talking to a group of woodworkers. So what would you say? Okay. Okay. The, well, designing woodworkers, I guess, because I get asked advice a lot on on design. And, and, and a lot of the, uh, I think they get, you get hung up too much in the rules. And uh, um, there's, do you know who Lewis Sullivan was? No. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright called him the master. Okay. And you know who Frank Lloyd Wright was. Yeah. So uh, he, he was, Lewis Sullivan was the, um, they called him the uh, father of the skyscraper. Because when they first started buildings, uh, uh, designing buildings and went up in the air, they, uh, uh, before that, previous to that, all the uh, buildings, the uh, lines were uh, mostly horizontal because they were lower. So the, the first skyscrapers were designed with the horizontal line dominant. Mm. Well, Lewis Sullivan said, forget the rules. This is uh, this is a vertical design, and so the vertical line should be dominant. And everyone else had previous to that were stuck in the rules. So, uh, and and Lewis Sullivan has this little quote that I just love. That was something about the rules are good to get you started, but beyond that, they're a crutch. You need to step out on your own mm. and and use your intuition mm-hmm. and rely on that rather than relying on the rules. The rules are just a starting point. And and beyond that, you need to um, to go it on your own if you're going to do any new ground. Otherwise, you're you're going to just repeat what everybody else has done. I want to thank Daryl Peart for joining me today. Thanks, Daryl. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you.